Welcome to this week of Missouri Politics. After Thanksgiving edition, we are joined by one of the senior state senators in the Missouri State Senate, Senator Lauren Arthur from the north land of Kansas City, correct? God's country. Had you have a good holiday? It was a great holiday. It was a I ate many platefuls of just brown <laughs> carbs. It was the perfect Thanksgiving. And Mizzou win. Uh-huh. That was exciting. So when did you get elected to the House? 2014. So you were there for Mizzou's bottom of the barrel. Nobody wanted to be seen within 50 miles of that campus. It is amazing to me. And it's not just football. Basketball is doing well, but it's also academics. You don't hear rumors about them getting kicked out of the AAU anymore. You do see other schools like Nebraska kicked out. It is a complete 180. And I tell you, I don't know how to run a college. But from what I've seen, leadership matters. And Choi has turned that place around. I, you have to give him a lot of credit for that. Um, we have seen the full range of legislative opinions about the university, and I'm a Mizzou fan by marriage, so I didn't attend hmm. MU, but my husband did, and I've grown to be, become a huge fan. Um, both of their athletic pro programs, yeah. but just of, of everything that, that they're doing right now. So hats off. I'm glad to see it. It's not just good for you know, students who attend the university, it's good for our whole state. This state could not succeed to its best potential without Mizzou succeeding. And I think for in my professional lifetime, this is the best the campus has ever been viewed, I think, by the community, by the state, by the legislature. I think this is about peak Mizzou for my professional life. Mm -hmm. I, I expect if they come and ask for more money next session, they have some stuff to back up like to why it's on, a good, yeah. good investment. And I will and say... that's not always been the case. The legislature has not always done its part in making sure that they have the resources needed to succeed. But when you first got elected, you couldn't have with a straight face advocated to give that system more money. Well, They'd have been laughed out of the capital. I'm generally supportive of funding higher ed, but I think that there But it's easier some, when they're doing a good job. That's exactly right. Yep. Let's talk about some other schools. I, when I think of you, I think of somebody that's actually been... A teacher. You actually understand what everybody talks about in theory you've put into practice. That job is a lot harder than the one I have right now. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so right now, it feels to me like there's a, um, I think there's a movement for change. I don't know that people even really know exactly what they want, but I do think there's a, the waters are troubled about education. People want something different. What is something, what is some, a proposal out there you see that, that would offer some change and some uh, different alternatives? but wouldn't just totally destroy the system, especially for rural education. Well, I think before you look at change, you have to just get the foundation set. And mm -hmm. right now we have thousands of classrooms that are filled, that are either not filled at all or filled with um, basically a warm body because we can't recruit qualified teachers. And I think it's really important that we are putting a qualified quality person in every classroom that's been the one thing at a school level that makes a huge difference and can you do that without raising the caps on funding um raising the caps helps a lot well i mean if you're yeah why do people take jobs i mean why do people show up to work it's because they're getting paid right so if you pay them more theoretically they would show up more yeah and they ha you know teachers don't do it for the money obviously they can get better paying jobs elsewhere but the money helps the money helps and they have bills to pay like everyone yeah. else yeah uh, let me ask you this i i tell you what i've always found your arguments compelling i've always thought that especially in rural areas public education is the greatest thing as a state they can do then i ran into my corn man this is incompetent moron down in Poplar bluff how do you really feel about it? i can't stand it uh but more, there's a lot of missourians that don't start off hating schools they don't start off wanting to they're not charter school shills Boy, they've had their corn man moment, and they're pissed. What do you say to those folks? You know, it's interesting. I think there is a perception that people are really unhappy with public education. And if you ask them, I think they say generally, like, yeah, Missouri public schools, not great. We should be doing better. But if you then ask them, well, how do you feel about the school where your kid goes? Mm -hmm. They say, yeah, I think that school is doing a good job. I agree. And so um, I think a little bit of it is perception, but I also think like we should, there, there are examples of great things that schools are doing across the state. I totally agree with you, but you go back to when you have that corn man moment. I mean, this is a guy that they, Hillsborough took 100,000 tax dollars and paid him just to never come back. Shouldn't there be some kind of register of these failed superintendents like corn man so folks can 
taxpayers can know if they're getting sold a pig and a poke. Yeah, no, I think I think there definitely should be accountability, especially for leadership yeah. and superintendents. Um, and I am interested in applying that ac accountability across the board because what I hear instead of let's you know let's build up our public schools, what I hear is parents need options. You know, let them pick whatever school they want to go to, and let our state funding follow that child to whatever school. Okay, that's an interesting idea, but mm -hmm. the problem is we don't have any accountability in place for those schools, so I don't even know how my kid is doing. Yeah. Well, or, or as a, a lawmaker, more importantly, someone who's going to appropriate the money and say, yeah, this is a good investment, we're seeing results. I don't have the data because the legislation doesn't require the same accountability for other schools that are receiving public funding to say, this is how our students are doing. This well, this is, is the show me state. Why don't they step up and provide it to you, right? Well, yeah. I'd be interested in seeing it, yeah. Talk about the Commissioner of Education, Margie Van Dieven, stepping aside. They're in the process of selecting a new commissioner. Number one, what does DESE do? A lot. Okay. <laughs> Maybe too much. I, you know, I think they are responsible both for the accountability system, the accreditation system, then they're also supposed to outline goals for education in our state, offer support for, for public schools and school districts. So I think they have to, they're responsible for covering a lot of ground. I generally get told by them they can't do anything about problems. <laughs> That's generally, and they say, if you see Lincoln, tell him we need more money. That's generally the two things that I hear. Should Desi call out failed administrators? Well, I, think, I hear them always say, well, they do this. There's a whole wall of it's not our job, it's, but give us more money. I, I was at a uh, retreat these last few days on the topic of education policy, and there were a couple of commissioners from DESE. Hmm. And that question came up about bureaucracy and a lot of finger pointing, and the school board can't do it, and they say it's because of the state, and the state says they can't do it mm -hmm. because of the school boards. Live that. And I, I, I respected that one of the DESE commissioners basically acknowledged that that is a problem and that there shouldn't be that finger pointing back and forth and maybe there should be some clarification about who's responsible for what. Who would make a good commissioner? What, what, would, what would be the qualities in a good DESE commissioner? I think someone who has experience in schools, someone who has succeeded in turning around or improving a school district or system. Practical classroom experience? Yeah, I think that would, would um, garner a lot of respect. And someone who has a vision. For... More than one person suggested you're the person for that job. Are you interested? Um, my plan after I, re I, uh, I term out is to win the lottery and ride <laughs> off into the sunset, so I might be busy. But <laughs> well, let me ask you this. You do have another session before you head out. Tell me what you think is going to happen in the Senate next session. Um, maybe not much, but I've told a so few, mission accomplished. I've told a few people that like when you start with such a low bar, yeah, anything that happens that's positive is like an overwhelming success. So I don't know. Um, I'll. It seems like some of my colleagues don't like each other very much. I get that impression. And it's it's really not. Um, it's really not Republican Democrat. It's Republican Republican. Yeah, I never expected that in a, a as a member of the super mi minority, people would Republicans would like me more than they like each other. But um, well, maybe it's just your charm, right? Oh well. Well, you came in with Ron Richard, and Ron was very much. Uh, uh, there, there were some partisan fights then. Mm -hmm. Now the the fights are partisan. They're just Republican on Republican. Yeah. And sometimes that's a really good thing when there are bills that I don't like. It saves time on your feet, right? It does. It does. I've, um, I've been able to grab lunch and <laughs> even a dinner occasionally, which is not usually the case. But, um, but at the same time, like, I live in Missouri, and I, you know, I want good things to pass, and I want to help the people that I was elected to serve. And I think there is a group of people who who just want to put the nonsense and the noise aside and do our jobs. And then there are uh, others who see a camera and see... A Facebook page. Uh -huh, and and, and um, see opportunity. Let me ask you this. Um, you came out last session. The governor in the state of the state, of the state came out about child care. It was a practical problem for people that want to work. To me, if you want to work, let's, let's work with you, mm -hmm. right? You came up with a child care initiative that I guess the bill didn't pass, but by God, it got funded. 
Is there another issue like that you see that you want to take on in your last session? I mean, I'm not done with child care. And my uh, full credit to the governor for recognizing that this is a real problem and one that it doesn't matter if you're Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter if you live in Kansas City or in, in the Boot Hill. Senator Lauren Arthur, thank you for the time. We appreciate it. Thank you. We'll be right back with our Opinion Maker panel. We're representing Barry Holis from Jackson. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople, while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Hello, and thank you for joining us here on Justice and Journalism with me, Judge Mike Carter. St. Louis is the gateway to the West, mm -hmm. but if you want to go west from St. Louis, you got to squeeze under a railroad bridge on two lanes of traffic, and at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, that gets kind of tough. I certainly uh, chose to run for the Senate the first time because that gives you an opportunity uh, to slow legislation or adjust legislation that we, we don't think is good for the state, and that's precisely what we were doing. Data captured by our state-of-the-art monitors helps us pinpoint the timing and location of severe weather more accurately and respond to trouble more quickly. Ameren Missouri's investment in smart technologies like this is one way we're improving reliability and restoring power faster than ever. Responding to trouble before trouble hits. That's energy at work. Ameren Missouri. Welcome back to Wigan Missouri Politics Opinion Maker Panel Time. Austin Peterson hosts the Austin Peterson Show in the morning that actually looks a lot like this set, right? Yeah, right here, actually. We produce it uh, every Monday through Friday, 7 to 9 a.m. Central. The Wake Up America Show streams a two-hour live talk show. It's national news, but we get a lot of Jefferson City types, of course, because this is where we film. And so. check it out on Rumble, right? Rumble.com slash AP for Liberty. Yeah. Sarah Unsaker, State Representative of St. Louis County, running for yes. Attorney General. Yes, I am. Thanks for yeah, making the time. I'm so glad to be here. Friend of the show, Hannah Beers, thank you for making the time. I'm glad to be here. And Barry Hovis, not from Cape, from Jackson, Missouri, down in southeast Missouri. Thank you for making the time, sir. Thank you for the invite. All right, let's start right off the top, Barry. IP reform, been talked about a lot. I think there's probably... 163 votes for some kind of IP reform, but is there 82 for any one? You know, uh, we passed it out of the House before break last year, mm -hmm. and uh, the promise was that the Senate would take it up and try to get that dealt with. Um, it is one of our top three priorities again this year on the Republican side. I don't know how the Democrats are looking at it with their caucus, but we hope to get it out soon again this year uh, and try to settle on one because there's probably three or four versions out there that everybody thinks is better than the other. Presented by uh, one of your colleagues in the House, and a person that will be on the statewide ticket with you, Adam Swadron, had an idea. He said, you know, there, in the past, there's been some statutory changes by the public, and the legislature just came in and, re and, and ripped them up. Mm -hmm. Maybe it should be harder for the legislature to change a, uh, a something done by the people, but it should be harder to put something in the Constitution. Is there room for a compromise along those lines? Along those lines, I think there could be. I mean, you know, it's... The reason they're trying to put things in the Constitution these days is because it's so hard to make a statutory change um, when they're with an initiative petition because the legislature will come around like, with, like they did with the puppy mills mm -hmm. and turn it right over and replace it with whatever the legislature wants. So it's hard for the people to get their voice out. So I think you know, if we can make it where there is a way for the general public to have their voices heard. I think that's important. And, and when it's heard, have it hold up, right? I yes, mean, that's and the hold up, yeah. Austin, I mean, to me, there's a, it, it does feel like it's a little too easy to amend the Constitution right now in the state of Missouri. It also feels like it's a little too easy to change a statutory law passed by the voters. Yeah, I think that uh, you know, we get an opportunity to amend the Mur Missouri Constitution whatever once every 10 years, and if we Just get it. Just redraw it, right? Yeah, I think it's time for us to do it. The, the, the Constitution, as I understand it, and I stole this from former Representative Paul Kurtman, it's supposed to be the spirit of the law, 
not the letter of the law. And when you get you know, the average citizen trying to write into the Constitution what they think should be the code, then unfortunately you get all sorts of unintended consequences. Well, that's what we have right now with a ton of code in the Constitution. Especially with when it comes to the cannabis laws here in Missouri, that was a humongous mistake. I mean, I think that unfortunately because of the way the Republican makeup is right now, will they or won't they on the cannabis issue, that one particular one made it so that they were the voters felt forced to legalize it. I voted for that, even though a lot of my Republican friends didn't. But I think that if we were to amend the Missouri Constitution next time we get the chance, that's going to solve a lot of these problems. You know, I want to ask you two questions. First being, <clears throat> if voters can get policies they want, like a Medicaid expansion or smoking pot, mm-hmm. and vote for Republicans, which they feel a little better about voting for, does that not hurt the Democrats? I think it does. I, I also think the Democrats have realized that they cannot win at the ballot box with their candidates, right? They, they win in the cities, but they don't know how to talk to rural people. And so they only go through the initiative petition process now, which I think is the motivation to change it. But if, if some of these issues weren't enacted in the Constitution, it might make it easier for a Democratic candidate campaigning on those issues to win. Yeah, it might. I well, think I think they'd have to change their messaging in rural areas. Let's talk Are about you going to tell me that Jess Piper is not just absolutely blazing <laughs> a trail as a Democrat here in Missouri with messaging? Well, I have been a, to 15? I like yeah. Jess. I think Jess knew exactly what she was doing the whole time. Let me ask you this. Um, there's a wonderful gift being concocted for the Democrats by Republicans in this state. Some county clerks want to decide who's a Republican and who's not. Mm-hmm. Now let me ask you this. Is there any way by this test Donald Trump could have been on the ballot in 2016? That is a great question. I mean, you I have some do. rogue clerks, right, that want to have you a do. litmus test or you some do. swear off. Or you do, but I do also think in 2016 you saw an influx of people who were not traditional uh, Central Committee people come in right. and join the Central Committee. So when you look at our Central Committees now, they look a lot different than they did prior to 2016. Yes. There's a lot more of what you would classify as a Trump, Repub- Trump Republican. So what's going to happen with this? I mean, is this this can't be legal, right? The voters should decide who they want to elect, right? Not they some committee should, or whatever. They should, and I, I really, I'm not an attorney. It's hard for me to make the call on that. Some people say that the county committees do have a right to do that. Some people say they don't. I would say it's up to the people. I don't know how a, yeah. a central committee Win it has on the, the right to... Prediction time, Barry Hope, is the end of the day. Will <laughs> county committees be saying who's a Republican and who's not? Uh, I don't think so. I think there's some legal issues that go with that, and uh, so I think it'll probably come down. We've had our central committee, we, we had like 30 members on there. We were only half full of people that were interested in running. And then here recently we've had some groups that came in that are more constitutionalists slash libertarians, I think. And uh, they wanted to get on the Republican committee because they thought it was the easiest committee to get on to maybe get some of their values or whatever passed into law or have the ability to put certain candidates on the ballot. And I just think if we start picking and choosing who's a Republican because our caucus is so big and we have, I think, libertarians that run as Republicans. We have moderates that could run as a Democrat or Republican because of the, the, where they're at. And I think it's just important to let the people decide on who that person is. Well, they, will they end up having some little uh, Politburo picking candidates? I, I don't think it is. What happens? Either. Will there be some Republican Politburo that picks what the slate is? I really hope not. I think it's it should be up to the voters who decide who to vote for. Wait, and is it happened? Well, yeah, let's remember what happened back in 2012. There's a reason why we had the primaries and moved away from the caucuses is because a bunch of libertarians wanted to be Republicans and they came in and the Ron Paul people were taking over the caucuses and the Republican Party and felt they like they could not got, win as Republicans. That, exactly, and so they... Or, and yeah, win as Libertarians. They couldn't win as Libertarians. And so and they, then they decided to switch over to the Republicans. Exactly, so I, I, it could happen. I do think it could happen, yeah. So let's talk right. statewide ballot. Uh, it, let's say the Pilot Bureau of Republicans get together and pick an opponent. You'll be running in the primary for Attorney General. What made you decide to jump into the race? Because I don't see a whole lot of enforcement of government here. Um, I'm running to have safe kids and paid workers and real justice. And for example, when hospital workers weren't paid up in Mexico, Missouri, weren't paid their last yeah. paycheck, they were told to go get a lawyer. You know, I think the Attorney General's office had the jurisdiction to go after that employer and say, hey, hmm. you should have given your workers your paycheck and we're gonna make you do it. And instead, the AG told me, well, they need to go get a lawyer. And yeah. that's just not okay. And that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm running for attorney general. All right. Brass Tax, a Democrat running statewide, had a tough time. Nicole Galloway, the last person to win before her. It, mm-hmm. it's, it's a tough road to hoe. How yeah. do you win this race? By listening to voters. I'm going to be talking to voters all across the state. I'm going to be listening to voters. Um, I was told as a Democrat that I can't talk reliably about CAFOs because I live in the suburbs. But, you know, 
I don't talk out of my own experience necessarily about stuff like that. I talk by listening to voters and talking to voters and saying, okay, here, what are the issues when the runoff is polluting your water source? How does that impact you? And that's what I talk about. Even if it's not me personally impacted by it, it, it impacts the voters and I listen to them. Also, Peterson, statewide ballot, who do you, who you like? Give me, give me your Republican slate, not who you like, Who's going to win? Who do you like to win? Ooh, uh, on the governor's side of things, I think Jay Ashcroft probably is the most reasonable. But I actually think Bill Eigel has succeeded in making it almost a three-way race. I mean, when I go around the, the, the counties, the, the rural counties, people who know me from the races that I've run before, they all bring up Bill Eigel. They're very mm -hmm. excited about Bill Eigel. And there's a lot to be said about grassroots uh, energy here in the state of Missouri, especially in these rural areas. So I think that ultimately it does come down to Ashcroft versus Kehoe, but I think and it's a close race, but I think that Eigel's going to make a good showing of it, and I think he probably you know, gets his name recognition up for some other run down the future. Give me, give me this. Hey, you guys are working on a pack for Kehoe. Mm -hmm. um, talked to Aaron Baker this week on the Midweek Update. It, it kind of feels to me like Eigel has laid the, 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 the playbook out for how you would run against Jay Ashcroft. And Jay Ashcroft could have ran away with this, mm -hmm. That's not been the case. But, I mean, I would say he's obviously the front runner until the ads start flying. But as of right now, it looks like Eichel's laid out, this is how you'd run against him. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you, but I do think it's important to define. I think you've got, you've got Jay, who's a wonderful man. I, I worked for Jay fr fresh out of college. He's a great guy, yeah. Um, he's a great guy. His family's fantastic, and his dad served our country and our state so well. You've got Mike Kehoe, who is maybe the best retail politician I've ever seen. The bull like, of the woods. He just knows you. He remembers you. And then you've got Bill Eichel, who... Is really close with trial attorneys, and good for him. Um, but but, we'll but he does. Issues. I will say, Bill, <laughs> in my opinion, the best orator in the party. Yeah, he, I uh, think the he's, party is extreme. But he's, I think he's the he's best guy on a right-wing talk show. He knows how to light, touch all the right buttons. I think he's running the best campaign. But it, it has been a long time since you know the Cleet County Senator became governor from the state Senate. It's a tough road to hoe. It's been a while since Phil Donnelly. Barry Hovis, give me a down-ballot race you're looking at that's interesting. Uh, down in southeast Missouri that we have going on right now, uh, obviously the Senate race that we have going on down there, uh, Holly Rader is uh, running for lieutenant governor, so her seat is open. Her life up. just gets easier all the time, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll she, should, she should buy some scratch-off <laughs> tickets. I mean, if you look at her situation, she was ready to get the sitting speaker. Yeah. The sitting speaker has a few problems. Uh, yeah. Now maybe Bob Bonders, and maybe she gets both of them, right? Her best case scenario is both those guys staying, correct? Mm, that could happen, and uh, I'm not, you know, I'm... I'm Currently in the House of Representatives, and we have you know hearings going on with our current speaker. And until that's resolved, I think that is drag on his part of it. And uh, so you know, Holly's probably set it pretty well right now. The other gentleman, I don't know too well. So we'll see how that goes. Let me ask you, how long do you give that committee to? to I mean, they is, is there a is there a talk in your caucus that okay, you should be able to wrap this up by session, or is it just going to stretch forever? Well, uh, my official comment on that in Southeast Missouri was I always respect the people that are doing that investigation to complete it before I pass judgment. Yeah. And I, I think it'll be a drag on us if it continues into session. I'm hoping that it's completed pretty quickly. And from my understanding is we are going to try to get this wrapped up before we get back yeah, into give session. Give me a prediction. Is this, does this lag in a session? I think some folks want it to. I, I think it Regardless of what their decision is, it lags into session. What do you think? Is this going to be? Is this going to be going on in session? I mean, I don't think there's any way to get around the fact that you know there's a huge ethics investigation into our speaker right now. Yeah. Um, it's going to it's going to make an impact on session one way or another. Does this get wrapped up or does this drag on? Uh, it might drag on. I've noticed a lot of people refiling their reports uh, a lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Hannah Beers, let's talk about an issue you've talked about several times on this show, education reform. Yeah. Uh, the representative was in town for the Hunt Institute. I had Lauren Arthur on mm -hmm. earlier. I asked her if she might be the new Desi commissioner, and uh, she said a lot of words. None of them was no. <laughs> <laughs> what is something that could pass? To uh. me... I think if you if you look on the future, it's not maybe this session, but next session that something significant on schools gets done. What is something that could happen this session on schools? Well, I think first of all, I, I think that sometimes people think of the school choice movement as anti-public school, and I, that is that could not be further from the truth. I agree. Ultimately, the school choice movement is about just making sure kids get a good education. Yeah. And if public schools are doing their jobs, great. I had a great public school. We had great test scores, great teachers, great administrators. I think open enrollment would be fantastic. I have a 15 month old son, so we're a few years away from school, but I'm never sending him to the elementary school in the district we live in. Also, Peterson, I've been on your show and I was like, oh, you charter people, just a bunch of city dorks. I had my corn man moment. I met the superintendent. I met the problem, looked him right in the eye. 
Desi would tell you, it's not our fault. They'll tell you every, there's a whole wall of associations and thousands of people. When you have a clear, problematic person, they'll say, oh, corn man shouldn't be teaching kids. That's terrible. I hate that. Then they'll go, it's not our problem. It's over here. I think maybe enough people have, like myself have had their corn man moment, and they're pissed off. Some of the voter anger that uh, uh, was during the COVID-19 pandemic is still around, and I think it exists in the education bubble. And I think the reason for that is because we are seeing a lot of the negative secondary and tertiary effects, the impacts of the closures of these schools with the, the students. Sure. And we're seeing some of the mental health problems that these students are facing, some of the, the, uh, the development that's been delayed from these students. And I think that's why, because we are just now starting to see the impacts of that. So there's a lot of hostility that voters have when it comes to the educational system. So I, I do see that as a big issue. And it, it is the, you know, the after impacts of COVID. Representative, I, I tell you, I, I've been a big promoter of public schools, still am. But when you have your corn man moment and everybody behind the scenes says that's terrible, something should happen, but oh, we can't say anything. You just get to like, what do you do? Like, what is the point of this bureaucracy if it does nothing? Well, I agree. Bureaucracy should be, you know, holding government accountable and doing their job. You know, but it feels like they're need... all in on the joke together. I mean, I'm not going to disagree with that. It, it does feel like there's, you know, the, the public schools need to be doing their job and we need to hold them accountable. Um, but as far as school choice, we don't have any accountability for private schools. We have very little for charter schools, none for homeschool kids. You know, we need to make sure all of these kids get a good education, all of them, wherever is a good school for them. And the only places where we have any oversight over the schools is the public schools. Mm -hmm. So why are we saying, well, we shouldn't make the public schools do their job. We should just give parents money to take their child, kids someplace where we won't make sure we don't even have jurisdiction to make sure they have. We'll, they'll we'll do have their jurisdiction job. to get booted off the air if we don't go. So <laughs> with a minute left, who won the week? Right? Yeah. So uh, I'm sorry, we're still talking about the school. No, who won the week? We're about to get booted out of here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so who won the week? I don't know. I would have to say the Hunt Institute because I went to that for the last day and a half and I learned a lot about what we're trying to do nationally. Governor Hunt started that, uh, that uh, I guess, company or not company, but program when he was governor from North Carolina. There was a lot of people up in there and we shared and learned a lot. Who won the week? I'd say the boot heel. Jamie Berger had like a that. great uh, turnout, over 200 mm -hmm. people at his fundraiser. Yep. Cameron Parker, Donnie Brown have a big event this weekend. And then Senator Bean announces Kyle Abishan as the new chief of staff for the 25th. A great so gift for him. He so came back home. Great week Who won the week? Henry Kissinger. Ah, oh, what a life. <laughs> Triple digits. You know, he was influential into his 90s, self-made man, and he's not going to live to see the next hen next Donald Trump presidency. Spend, he spent some time here in Jeff City. <laughs> Who won the week, Austin Peters? I got two answers. One, Eric Schmidt for standing up for military service members on Fox News who were uh, kicked out for not taking the vaccine. I got to give him credit for that. Yeah. And two, Kansas City wins because Taylor Swift moves to Kansas City and the economy gets a little bit of a bump there from mm -hmm. her reaching billionaire status. Only problem is, is that she moved, she moved to the wrong side, the Kansas side. But it's still, we're going to get that a little bit of that extra Taylor bump there. That might my daughter very happy. I'm going to say my old buddy Kevin Gunn took a new job uh, with Evergy. Uh, they got a great guy and a guy that's uh, served the state very well. I'm happy to see what the next chapter unfolds for him. We will see you back here next week for This Week in Missouri Politics with Lieutenant Governor Mike Keogh. This Week in Missouri Politics is sponsored by the Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, Ameren, Spire, and the United Electric Cooperative.